So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Suzanne Mooney, and I'm an associate professor at, at Tama Art University here in Tokyo. And I'm also a practicing visual artist working with uh, various technologies. And today I have, the, I have the great pleasure of moderating this technology breakout session. So you're all very welcome. Um, so this is, I mean, this is really a crucial time for rethinking the relationship between technology and design and, well, technology and everything. And we're thinking um, technology and the planet, our bodies, ethics. And um, I hope we can touch upon at least some of these like, critical issues in technology now in this session. Uh, so it, in the first half, uh, we're going to hear from our presenters, and in the second half, we're going to, through discussion, attempt to um, put together a statement on this topic, uh, this very broad topic of technology. Um, so let me start by giving an outline of the session flow and briefly introducing our panelists. So as I mentioned in the first half, we'll hear a short presentation from each of our three panelists. Um, so Mr. Uh, Yutaka Matsuo, a professor at the Graduate School of Engineering in the University of Tokyo. And then after that, uh, Ms. Miyuki Tanaka, who's uh, a curator and producer, uh, creating under the theme of disability as a perspective that redefines the world. And then uh, lastly, we'll hear from Mr. Koji Sasaki, who's an anthropologist and chief researcher in the research and development group at Hitachi. And also joining us uh, for this breakout session, uh, hidden over in the back, <laughs> we have our esteemed keynote speaker, Ms. Anna Ariola Canada. Uh, so her role here today is as observer, um, but uh, we are hoping to make better use of you than <laughs> simply an observer, and we hope you'll join us uh, for the latter half for our discussion. Um, so thank you for the exciting and really insightful keynote speech this morning. The contents, no doubt, will inform our discussion here today in the second half. And in particular, I'm looking forward to hearing your insights and comments with regards to our collective statement on technology. So after uh, relatively short 15-minute presentations from our three speakers, um, we'll, if we have time, if we don't run over time, maybe we'll have a little time for a few questions from, from, uh, from you. And then we'll take a 30-minute break and then return for the second half of the session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. So uh, Mr. Yutaka Matsuo, he's a professor in the Graduate School of Engineering at the University of Tokyo. Uh, his areas of expertise are artificial intelligence and deep learning, and he will give us some insight into these cutting edge technologies, as well as presenting us with uh, various perspectives on these recent developments, starting with the quite positive title of Generative AI for a Better Society. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, overview the, uh, what is going on in the, uh, uh, with res respect to the uh, technology side of AI. The title is Generative AI for a Better Society. Um, ah, so <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, this is my uh, self-introduction. Uh, I've been working on uh, AI for more than 25 years. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, no one was talking about AI, so I'm very happy recently everyone is talking about <laughs> AI. <laughs> and, uh, uh, from uh, this year, May of this year, uh, I uh, have the privilege of uh, uh, serving as a chairperson uh, of the AI Strategy Council by the government. And uh, let me start with the, the history of AI. Um, AI has been, uh, AI uh, was studied uh, in two, uh, 1956, so it has a history more than uh, 60 years or more. And uh, recently, with the advancement of generative AI, the people are increasingly amazed by the technology, and uh, more and more companies and organizations are seeking to leverage generative AI. Uh, actually, the generative AI is uh, a kind of deep learning technology, and deep learning technology is the core of the, the third boom of AI. And uh, it, it is uh, uh, heavily rely, relying on the uh, machine power and data volume. And there are two key technologies. Um, I, I don't want to go into detail, but uh, 
uh, the two important keywords are uh, transformers and uh, self-supervised learning. Uh, sorry, this is a uh, mistake, self-supervised learning. The uh, uh, transformer uh, introduced by Google researchers in 2017 uh, play a crucial role in uh, large language models. Uh, they employ a mechanism known as the self-attention mechanism which adapts uh, processing based on the input information uh, to a neural network. And the self-supervised learning uh, uh, is also very important uh, in the context of natural language processing. A typical uh, self-supervised learning method is uh, uh, called uh, next word prediction. So uh, where next word is predicted ba based on predicting a preceding text, a repeated iteration of this process uh, lead to uh, models that can effectively anticipate the following words, ena ena enabling the model to learn grammar, causality, and various forms of knowledge embedded in the text. Uh, these, uh, these large language models, LLMs, are uh, utilizing these two uh, uh, technologies, uh, and uh, they are known to follow a scaling law uh, meaning that uh, accuracy increases with the size of the model's uh, parameters. For instance, uh, GPT-3 introduced in 2020 uh, has 175 billion parameters, and it's been reported that GPT-4 has 2 trillion parameters. Uh, these models can answer various questions generating text, trans translate language, and generate creative ideas. And in addition to text generation, another notable area is image generation, uh, which has emerged with uh, models like the diffusion model. Uh, this is the uh, diffusion model. We put uh, noise to the, the clean picture, and uh, we train the model to recover from, from the noisy image to the clean uh, image. Uh, noteworthy services include uh, uh, stable diffusion and mid-journey, uh, which are based on models with variance of parameters. Uh, by providing a few keywords, uh, stable or diffusion can generate images meeting your specific requirement uh, in tens of seconds. Uh, generative AI models require a substantial amount of training data, often drawn from the internet, Wikipedia, books, and various other sources. However, the ethical consideration and respect for creators are crucial. Discussions are ongoing worldwide regarding mechanisms to compensate copyright holders, uh, among other topics. The advancement in generative AI are already uh, reshaping the way people work. Organizations increasing, uh, increasingly employ LLMs to search for internal document or gener gener generate ideas for new businesses. Uh, we are uh, not only witnessing horizontal integration, but also vertical integration across various industries. We, for, for, instances, uh, for instance, uh, com combining AI with the medical and financial sectors could potentially uh, enhance doctor productivity or automate investment decisions to accelerate uh, business growth. Uh, the design industry is also uh, progressing in its use of generative AI. Initially, generative AI can serve as a foundation for design. It can read uh, clients' conversations and create design templates or extract highly relevant data from extensive historical data to generate uh, initial draft. Instead of generative AI creating the final design, it is more likely to work collaboratively uh, with designers providing feedbacks and engaging in a creative dialogue with AI. Adobe has al al already announced the development of services uh, in incorporating generative AI, and numerous startups are creating AI services for design creation. Uh, one of AI's promising role is uh, democratizing design. By connecting the system necessary for design creation with large language models, services are emerging that allows users to manipulate systems and create their designs through verbal in instructions. 
This can empower more people to utilize and create systems that were uh, previously accessible only to uh, skilled professionals uh, in specific fields, uh, such as uh, architecture design or uh, game creation. In a society where AI is increasingly integrated in various ways, the uh, required skill set is evolving, while mastering AI-related uh, skills, including IT and design skills, will remain uh, crucial. The ability to uh, evaluate and make judgment about what AI generates will also become essential. Uh, in conclusion, uh, generative AI, rather than uh, replacing humans, can assist them in creating more sophisticate, sophisticated and accurate designs in less time. Generative AI is expected to uh, continue evolving, potentially extending to video generation, uh, tackling more complex tasks uh, through LLMs, and even in, control, in controlling robots. Uh, we encourage you to uh, stay informed about this technological advancement and to view generative AI as a variable to, uh, to, uh, to enhance your activity rather than uh, as a threat. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, like very rich and very and also very concise presentation. Um, I'm guessing within the audience we have here, there's some of you who are probably very familiar with these concepts and some of you that are less familiar with these concepts. Um, I was thinking about asking for a show of hands for how many are using AI tech, but maybe the opposite is more <laughs> uh, how many are not. It's very difficult, even out of curiosity, to avoid these at the moment. But um, without a doubt, it's being very quickly adopted and integrated within so many different aspects of our lives. Um, right now. So um, before we move on to our second presenter, maybe um, if anyone has a, a question immediately um, about our first speaker's uh, presentation, we can make a, take a moment to feel that question. And if not, we'll hold off until the end of the three speakers. Okay, in that case, um, I think we'll move to our uh, second presenter. Uh, so our second presenter, um, uh, Ms. Tanaka, she, um, she's worked on a variety of different projects, including uh, exhibitions and performances under the theme, as I mentioned, disability as a perspective that redefines the world. So her presentation today will not only give us an introduction to her approach to creation, um, but also uh, a critical insight into the need to adopt more diverse, inclusive thinking in relation to technology and design. Hi, I'm Miyuki Tanaka. Today I'm going to talk about uh, disability in relation to technology. And is technology enabling or disabling us? Is my question. Oh, <laughs> my work, uh, as, a, as Susan introduced, uh, my work involves uh, producing expressions performances, and various projects under the theme of uh, disability as a perspective that redefines the world. I see disability not as a problem that belongs to an individual, but rather a perspective from which society as a whole can be enriched and more interesting. I try to create opportunities for people with disabilities to realize the inherent values of their bodies and senses and how they can bring them to society. So I incorporate accessibility as a means to evolve, evoke diverse aesthetics among our audiences. Most importantly, I aim to challenge the norms in the arts and society by working with people with disabilities. Now let me share some examples. Uh, watching, by, uh, watching Dance by Listening is a project that, I, that challenges our perception of dance by incorporating audio descriptions for the audience members with and without visual impairment. Audio description, as you might know already, is a form of narration that conveys visual information so that people with visual impairment can enjoy the experience better. In this project, blind and sighted audiences watch a 10-minute contemporary dance performance with audio descriptions. 
the audience used portable radio to switch between various audio channels, each offering audio descriptions from various perspectives while watching the dance performance. For example, in our first year, we provided audio descriptions from the perspective of the dancer, an audience member, and the Japanese traditional theater, no, uh, as some of you might not familiar, N-O-H, a no artist who described himself as a stage with the dancer as an intruder. The dance performance was presented both with light and without light, and audiences were invited to share their impressions and interpretations after the performance. The Audio Game Center is another project aimed at creating audio-based games among sighted and blind programmers and produce a place for people to play and develop those games, regardless of whether they have visual impairment or not. Computer games have been video-driven, but by putting sound at the center, blind programmers can lead the development and implementation of these games. As a person without disabilities, I believe my mission is to shake up the normalcy of our society. The exhibition rules showcase the existence and impact of the rules we encounter in everyday life and explored approaches to design rules. We envision the exhibition itself as a model of society where visitors could e exchange their views bought for things that were then reflected in the exhibits and move around the objects in the venue. Our aim was to cultivate a positive engagement with rules and some simultaneously by including the lives and customs of minority groups, I wanted to make people aware of those who are excluded from the so societal rules that many people take for granted. When we talk about disability, there are two primary models, the medical model and social model. The medical model thinks a person's impairment as the problem, while the social model identifies the built environment as the issue. While the medical model aims to fix the individual, the social model finds disability as a result of the mismatch between a person's body and the norms of society and communication. Undeniably, technology has significantly improved the lives of everyone, including individuals with disabilities. Technology serves multiple purposes, from enhancing sensory experiences to providing essential navigational information. It has empowered us to accomplish tasks that were once inconceivable. We can say all technology is assistive. Nevertheless, we have a distinct term, assistive technology, specifically intended for those with disabilities. Unfortunately, when we use the term assistive technology, it often implies a focus on supporting the impairment, which aligns with the medical model of disability. This perspe perspective stems from the belief that technology is the solution to the problems of disability. Many of no our narratives surrounding technology and disability portray this technology as a means of redemption, granting the power to normalize individuals with disabilities, allowing them to quote unquote overcome their disabilities. In media and in wider conversation, depictions of disability really deviate from the goal of normalization. This perspective on technology is rooted in ableism. Ableism refers to explicit or implicit discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities 
based on the beliefs and values held by the non-disabled society, such as productivity, efficiency, intelligence, capitalism, and so on. There are so many videos, images, memes, and stories online about disabled individuals overcoming their impairment. On the left is a screenshot of a YouTube video titled Deaf People Hearing Sound for the First Time. The video collects the emotional reactions of a deaf person as they hear the voice of a family member or a loved one for the first time with the help of a cochlear implant moving the host to tears. On the right, there is a photo of a young woman in a wheelchair wearing a dress while holding hands with an able-bodied young man in a tuxedo. The text in the photo reads, he asked her to prom even in her condition, like and share equal respect. Even in her condition implies that her disability is a burden and that disability, disabled people are ultimately uh, undesirable. These depictions are referred to as inspiration porn, a term coined by the disabled journalist and disability rights activist Stella Young. Inspiration porn portrays disabled people to make non-disabled people feel good or reduces them into objects of inspiration. It uses disabled individuals as props to carry a motivational message to make non-disabled individuals feel grateful not to have those disabilities, rather than respecting the individual humanity of disabled people. In many stories about technology and disability, there is a prevailing theme of technology having the power to normalize disabled people. This perspective can reinforce ableism and has been termed Techno-ableism by Ashley Shaw from Virginia Tech. Techno-ableism is a specific form of ableism, prominently visible in media and entertainment, and prevalent in casual discussions about technologies designed for disability. It speaks of empowering disabled individuals through technology, but on the other hand, reinforces ableist stereotypes about what types of body minds are considered desirable and who is deemed worthy. It's a belief in the power of technology that advocates for the elimination of disability as a positive goal, favoring non-disabled ways of life. And taking cochlear implants as an example, these devices are surgically inserted in, into the inner ear of people with hearing impairment to provide sound signals directly to their brain. While they are regarded as the best in terms of technological or clinical solutions, they remain a subject of controversy within the deaf community. Many deaf individuals don't consider themselves disabled, but instead identify themselves as part of a linguistic or cultural minority as their primary language is sign language. They may not desire the ability to hear or speak and are concerned about losing their language and community. However, the majority of deaf individuals are born into hearing families and these parents often wish their children could hear and communicate like them. The process of adapting to cochlear implants is time consuming expensive and challenging, often leading to a struggle to maintain their identity within either the deaf or hearing world. So in this case, technology, while improving impairment, can also create divisions within communities. In this context, as the number of people with disabilities is expected to increase due to global environmental changes and an aging population, it's vital to recognize that disability is not always something to be fixed. This leads us to two important questions. 
how can technology avoid ableism? And how can we design technology that appreciates the vulnerability and the interdependence of humans? I'd like to bring two examples here. And this is one of them is Sakib Shaikh as software engineering manager, AI for good at Microsoft. His latest project, Seeing AI, enables individuals with visual, visual impairment to use their phone to learn more about the text, people, and objects in their surroundings. Sakib's work goes beyond inclusive design as he is at the core of its development. Involve, but involving people with disabilities in the development process provides an opportunity to challenge and dismantle ableism. And we are beginning to see examples of such developments slowly being implemented. And another example is uh, work uh, is weak robots by, by Michio Okada. Technology has expanded our capabilities and created the illusion that we can achieve everything independently. However, the, uh, the reality is that we cannot accomplish much alone, and we live in an interdependent society. Therefore, uh, sorry, however, technology often obscures this fundamental interdependency. So this project, Weak Robots by Michio Okada, uh, trash can, uh, there are trash can uh, on the right side, like uh, blue one and red one. Uh, these trash cans cannot pick up trash by themselves, but they come close to the trash or they come close to the people walking on, on the, uh, in the room and makes a bowing gesture. So this undependable robot who feels its purpose of picking up trash through interaction with others, not by themselves. And this is an example of using technology to emphasize and make human involvement more visible. I'd like to emphasize the need to shift the narrative around technology and disability advocating for a more inclusive and socially focused approach. It is essential to consider technology as a means of enhancing participation rather than merely fixing individuals with disabilities. And I think design has the power to contribute in that direction and hope to discuss more later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so as before, does anyone have an immediate question that they'd like to ask? If not, then we'll wait until the end. Um, okay, as you can see already, we're, we, this panel has um, quite diverse backgrounds and perspectives, and that's what we're hoping to nurture today in this discussion. Um, and our next speaker is Mr. Koji Sasaki, who is an anthropologist and also chief researcher in the research and development group at Hitachi, where he's led various projects on social and ecological systems change. Um, he's also a senior researcher at Keio University, and today he will introduce some projects under the core concept of transition and relating to various current issues in technology, such as ethics, AI, ecological crises and beyond. So hopefully that will help to lead towards our discussion um, of all three panelists uh, afterwards. Thank you. Do we have the slide? Yes. So thank you. Uh, my name is Koji Sasaki. I'm a chief researcher at Hitachi Research and Development Good. Uh, I'm originally an anthropologist, uh, but in the past 10 years I've been involved in diverse domains, and um, I think the fact that I was forced to work in these uh, very different uh, sectors have uh, really influenced my work in the past. Uh, this short presentation will be center centered around a few questions concerning our time and a new practice of design. One, what is the most fundamental context of design today? Two, uh, why does transitions thinking that I will be talking about matter? 
what does it tell us about the new directions in design? Um, I do believe that the discussion of the meaning of design and technology today needs to happen with recognizing the most fundamental context of them. Uh, I'd like to uh, start first uh, by grounding ourselves in the planetary crisis that we are in. Uh, this shows uh, the, uh, the Earth's average temperature over the past 65 million years. Today, uh, we're in the age of Anthropocene. As many of you may know, uh, it is a geological epoch by uh, distinct human impact. Saying that the humans are now in the Anthropocene is to say that the Holocene, the relatively mild climate that started 12,000 years ago, uh, which is the only condition that allowed the human civilizations to have prospered, has come to an end. The Anthropocene is a period of the great acceleration, where the exponential growth of the, our socioeconomic activities are leading to the exponential destruction of the planet's ecological system. So that is why uh, Earth system scientists such as Johann Rockström propose the concepts of the planetary boundaries. The planetary boundaries uh, show the limits to the human impacts on the planetary environment to define the safe and operating uh, space for humanity. Uh, unfortunately, the most recent study shows that the six out of nine boundaries, uh, including novel entities, biosphere integrity, climate change, and uh, biogeochemical flows, have crossed. Uh, with fast moving towards planetary tipping points, uh, beyond which the Earth will start stabilizing in another resilient state in which the planet began acting against the human survival. If this abrupt change happens, the Mother Earth will become a hostile Earth, which behaves like an uncontrollable enemy to humanity. It is also important to note that people on Earth are differently positioned in the global map of environmental devastation. The Anthropocene is this in, uh, the inseparable from uh, global structure of the political and economic inequality. It is a reflection of the enormous injustice we need to address. Sorry. That was bothering my paper. Um, So it would be highly disturbing for design practitioners today to admit that design was not the counteractive force to prevent, our mit, uh, prevent or mitigate the tendency. In fact, as Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley suggest, design was actually at the heart of the massive human influence on the planetary environment. Design has created amazing artifacts, equipment, uh, machines, materials, tools. But as Colomina and Wigley warns that the smooth surface and stunning visuals can distract us from the larger context. They say, so strong is this visual effect, so reassuring and dazzling are the surfaces, that it becomes unclear whether, uh, whether good design is doing good thing at all. So it is an, an extremely well bent point to our discussion on the uh, future of technology and design. We have the tendency to overlook the long-term effect of technologies. Nathalie Gontar, a French scientist of biodegradable plastic, describes the, the, the enormous and rapid expansion of the high molecular polymers in the late 20th century. She points to the fact that the outstanding functionality and the low cost of these materials made us largely blind to the long-term risks of these molecular structures going into our natural material cycle. Today, these small substances are in the ocean, soil, in the fish, birds, cows, rain, air, and in our human bodies. She declares that the humans have failed to control the plastics. It is somewhat comparable to our relationship to the nuclear weapons. Will Steffen, one of the leading scholars of the Earth System Science, uh, declared that the period of the human age, the Anthropocene, starts in 1945 with the first nuclear weapon spreading the radioactive substances on the Earth's surface. Uh, we have not been able to abolish these weapons and are still under their threats. Many of us know that the artificial objects we are launching into space are colliding with each other to make a tremendous amount of debris around the orbit. The European Space Agency have published a report on the space debris. Uh, in the past few years, we are seeing an exponential growth of the number of objects we are throwing into the space. They declare that the current pace is not sustainable. So these are the most important conditions of technology and design of our time. 
the exponential growth of the ecological devastation is pushing our planet closer and closer to the tipping points. But we are so constantly mesmerized by the beauty, enchantment, linguistic fluency of the designed technologies that the large majority of us are all right continuing on the older past. It is the most dangerous situation I could ever think of. So all of these realizations really came home to me in the crazy past several years. At the turn of the 2020s was a time marked by the realization of the deeply unsustainable nature of many of the systems that we had lived in. Our carbon, lifestyle, our carbon intensive lifestyle, our destruction of nature and pandemic, a deep sense of injustice was permeating through many of these issues we were facing. It is so clearly charted in the global carbon emission diagram. Our business as usual accelerates towards a dead end. With all the decarbonizing policies announced, we were so far away from the carbon neutral path. Now we need to flip the story and take on a completely new path that reverses the historical trend. So we were living in a time of liminality. We were caught in between the old and sustainable order which is no longer valid, but the new sustainable order is yet to emerge. I was a former assistant professor at a private university in Japan who had just joined Hitachi just a few years back because of an incident beyond my control, and I really wanted to dedicate myself to explore and find a way I can use uh, this liminal condition to reimagine the world we want and identify the pathways uh, to reach there. So I found an immense encouragement in this remark by an AI researcher you are personally responsible for becoming more ethical than the society you grew up in. <laughs> oh yeah. So it was in this context that the concept of transition seemed extremely useful. Uh, transition in sustainability science generally refers to a process of social and technical transformation to a sustainable system. Uh, Frank Gilles, one of the most prominent scholars in this field, describes the process in which he calls the multi-level perspective. Uh, what I found interesting in this view uh, is that, uh, that the different elements in a particular social technical system, uh, including technologies, market, uh, consumer preferences, policies, uh, these form a regime in a mutually supporting manner. According to Gilles, this relatively sta stable regime is challenged by the pressure from the global uh, macro-level landscape and the micro-level niche innovations. As a result, the regional system is gradually replaced by a new one. Uh, although it is a highly schematic framework, I found Gill's theory useful in visualizing the long-term systemic change that we wish to highlight. Uh, I also wanted to combine this perspective with the notion of co-creative systems change advocated by scholars like Donella Meadows, who described the process of bringing all the stakeholders to describe the systemic issue of the present and envision an alternative system to build together. And uh, this iterative process uh, of co envisioning in the future and identifying the pathway to achieve them uh, became pretty similar to the steps of transition design uh, theorized by visionally such as Terry Irwin. So during the time of multi-dimensional crisis, uh, I wanted to use the image of transition as a core concept for Hitachi to critically understand the world we live in, co envision the kind of world we want in the future, and describe the pathways to connect the two. So it is not just far, but also near that matters. So when the global pandemic was turning the world upside down, forcing people to live in extreme despair and isol uh, isolation, I proposed to Hitachi that we should explore the visions of sustainable futures, that the multidimensional transformation that we need to achieve, looking at the future that lie ahead Lie, lie beyond the crisis. Ideally, whose visions, uh, these visions uh, would look like a digital manifesto in, in liminality, which could be accessed online by the younger generations whose lives were deeply affected by the coronavirus. Uh, what I propose to do is to focus on some of the transitions we found essential to achieve sustainability. And instead of defining the narrative, uh, uh, def sorry, in instead of defining and narrating about them on our own, we wanted to focus on the leading or uniquely powerful social organizations or even visionary individuals, carefully study their perspectives and strategies on the kind of transitions they are, tr they are trying to make happen and describe them in their terms. It is as if 
describing their project, their vision, their agency, so we can incorporate some of them into our own. At the same time, if we collect these uniquely imagined transitions into future, uh, it would help envision the multi multi-dimensional transitions we were challenged to make happen. Uh, we spoke to the London office of Takram, a Japanese uh, uh, design studio, and asked them to help, to help us build a website where people can have access to these unique perspectives. Uh, I wanted to do so because we wanted to invite the design community to join the conversation also. Uh, this resulted in a web-based uh, web project called uh, Transitions to Sustainable Future. Uh, we, spoke to uh, we spoke to and study about a dozen organizations and individuals to learn from their visions of systemic transitions in their speciality. Uh, for each of the transitions, you will read a, a beautifully composed web page uh, on the details of the systemic transition they aspire to make happen. We also used uh, something called the Transition Pathways, uh, where we describe the unsustainable locked-in system on the left and a vision of sustainable system on the right. And we also describe the, the barriers and barriers of the transitions and necessary breakthrough to achieve the sustainable world. At the nine uh, transitions we described are combined to uh, this chart. It is a transformation marked by transition from fossil to renewable, from lineal to circular, from generative to regenerative, and so on. In November 2021, uh, we also presented another web-based project this uh, called a Transitions for a Human Nature Recovery. Uh, in the occasion of COP26, the United Nations uh, Conference on Climate Change. Uh, here we focus on the most pressing issues of the climate change, the biodiversity, and human life. So we really wanted to talk about the transition from the de degenerative, ecologically devastating civilization of the past to regenerate, uh, to regenerative civilization of, for the future. Uh, at Hitachi's joint research lab with the University of Tokyo, we were also building something called Transition Scenario. Um, it is a collaboration between Hitachi researcher and the University of Tokyo scholars to explore the multiple, uh, sorry, multi-sectoral change to achieve Japan's carbon neutrality in 2050. I will skip these slides because I'm speaking too long. <laughs> So uh, today, the darkest time of the pandemic is over, uh, but I'm a bit worried that the voice of the Build Back Better and sustainable recovery has faded away. In fact, the sustainability discourses in Japan have spread so much that it seems to me that people are paying less attention to it now. Uh, this would probably be a very bad thing to happen because although we have managed to overcome these corona crises, uh, practically nothing has really changed about the dangerous trajectories uh, we are on in terms of the planetary environmental crisis. So once again, I felt that companies like Hitachi should be guided by the most advanced thinking about the planetary environment. And I proposed to Hitachi that we should study and have dialogues with the leading scholars of sustainability sciences on the history of the human destruction of the planetary environment. Uh, I visited scholars at Stockholm Resilience Center, um, people like Professor uh, Gisli Paulson at the University of Iceland, who is the old student of uh, Mr. Uh, Timmy Gold, and Professor Johan Rockström, who's famous uh, for his study on the planetary boundaries. <laughs> At their office, conference rooms, uh, dining halls, and private homes, we exchange views on wide-ranging issues concerning the history of the Anthropocene uh, and the future research on the planetary boundaries and uh, sustainability transitions. Uh, at the same time, I was looking for the best way to share these insights I gained from these conversations with wider audience. Uh, as I was traveling long distance, I found myself listening to the same songs over and over during the flight at the airport while I was walking. Uh, while the music was playing in my ears, I was somehow put into a unique mental state where I was fully present in the ambience and all the things I was reading and learning about the planetary environment made perfect sense. What if we were to build a new technology to invite people to meditate, the most, meditate on the most advanced thinking in the planet, on the planetary environment and somehow change, their, change our being in the world? Uh, it looks like this. 
and it's called the Audio Planetarium for the Anthropocene. Uh, has a music behind it. And As you see, the website looks like a vintage audio player. Uh, you can sort of turn into three narratives uh, channels to learn about the planetary environment and the transition that we are challenged to make happen. The planet on which we stand is now undergoing rapid transformation. I don't have time, so I will skip. <laughs> and so um, we collaborate with four exceptionally unique musicians in the world to provide music uh, for us to help create the type of meditative state of mind. Um, I have a lot to talk about this, but um, our choice of music as a core means is for many reasons. But essentially, it is about the situation we are in, in terms of our being in the planetary crisis. Uh, we're used, used to receiving information about the human uh, making this world an inhabitable world. Uh, but in this time of the humanity, what we really need is a great reflection, isn't it? Um, it is the meditation and reflection about what we really are and what the world we want looks like and what we really need to do to achieve that world. And I think some types of music can help us position ourselves in the world uh, and clearly see who we are and give us the courage to hold on to it. Uh, this is final, final slide. Uh, finally, some um, remarks on the new direction of design. Uh, I think it is obvious, but I think it is absolutely important uh, and fruitful to step back a little bit from the client-only issues to reposition ourselves in terms of the planet crisis. Uh, it will require a new way of thinking. Um, we should be focusing on the systemic change instead of just a vision. Uh, we will no longer be human-only sender but we'll definitely be interested in uh, creating a better relationship between human and nature. Uh, our design will ultimately shift away from the tangible, external, material dimension, uh, but we need to pay more attention to exploring who we really are and the kind of human beings we really aspire to be on this planet with all these new technologies. Uh, we should learn to contemplate on the possibility of life in harmony with nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so hopefully we'll have time uh, for you to develop and talk a little bit more about some of that um, based on the questions that will come up. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor to questions in just a moment. Uh, but before that, I'd like to ask one question to all of our panelists, I guess to kind of set a grounding. Um, in the second half, we're going to talk about like the future, what we can do from now or where we're headed from now, whether that's a positive or a negative um, or somewhere in between, or even just this great unknown of where technology is headed. Uh, but before we do that, um, I'd like to ask you all um, just about your reflections. In recent years, we've had like uh, a global significant shift or change in various different ways in terms of the role that technology has played in our lives and uh, for various reasons. But I think the one that we all have in common here was the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I'll share with you just first my experience here in Japan. Um, I've been living here for quite a while, 15 years. And one of the things that really um, took me, I was taken aback by when I first came here, is this blending of very new technologies, but also this real fondness and love for old technologies. And there's old technologies the world has forgotten about that people are <laughs> very attached to here, one of them being the fax machine. And you might be surprised that <laughs> you can still send the fax more easily than, um, yeah, anyway, than you might expect. Uh, so there's there were things that in Japanese society, it seemed they were not going to change. Uh, it was difficult to shift to online meetings, for example. And it wasn't necessarily that it wasn't possible, but uh, there was a reluctance to even introduce the idea within an already fixed system. And then we had the COVID-19 pandemic and we had this shift towards just being able to um, sustain you know, education systems, work structures, social structures and so on. And out of that need, immediately we had to, everybody across generations, um, across societal spectrums had to or were forced to uh, accept a certain amount of mediation, technological mediation in everyday life, for good or for bad. And now we have 
and we're left with that. Some things have returned to the pre-pandemic time and some have not. Um, and I think it's it kind of relates to to I'm just trying to find like a commonality across all of you. And if we can talk about where we are now and how perhaps within your field of expertise and interest, how what changes have come back from that. It could be, for example, an additional pressure to be more uh, engage with technology that's not necessarily best or um, or to be available. Um, it could be that there were prioritization of, um, for example, within the healthcare field, uh, a lot of things were put on the back burner because of the need to deal with the crisis. Um, and there's also been these massive shifts in uh, how we engage with, with other people. Um, so thinking about where we are now in this post-COVID time in relation to technology, have you noticed any significant changes or shifts um, that you'd like to comment on before we, in the later section, talk about from now and into the future? Uh, who would like to begin? Yes, yeah, so uh, let me speak first. Um, uh, in my field of AI, the, the technologies uh, in Japan are uh, far behind compared to, for example, the, the countries like U United States and China. And uh, uh, Japanese large companies are reluctant to employ the, the new technologies and also the digital transformation. Uh, that has been a, a big problem for uh, these decades. But um, the, uh, the good news is that the people are more aware of that and people have more sense of um, uh, risks and uh, they, they they think they, they started to think uh, they have to change. Uh, the the good example is the generative AI. The chat GPT adoption is uh, uh, much higher compared to other countries. Actually, the chat GPT usage per capita is number one <laughs> worldwide. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's a. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so it, it's a uh, very good news, and uh, people are trying to change. And uh, uh, what I want to uh, do is to show the, the path uh, for the change and uh, how to adopt adoption of ChatGPT uh, uh, will uh, end up in the digital trans transformation and also the uh, uh, company growth. So that, that is yeah my view. Do you have any? Um, insight or even just your own theory as to why, um, like for example, uh, ChatGPT was so quickly adopted? Uh, yeah, there are uh, several reasons. Uh, the uh, Japanese uh, society has, has a, a sense of a crisis re recently, so, so they, they have to adopt new technology. So for example, the Web3 or the, the blockchain uh, technology uh, uh, adopted very fast in, in Japan. So uh, generative AI is also in, in the same context. Another reason is the chat GPT is the, the technology of language. So uh, maybe uh, many of you might not know, but the, the ability of language will grow uh, over you know, the life. So, so the, even the aging uh, population, uh, elderly people, has more, more advanced skill uh, of language uh, than the younger people. So other, other abilities like you know, uh, muscle power or you know, uh, the mathematics, the, the uh, uh, peak is like in 20s or 30s. And uh, after that, the, the, the ability deteriorates, but uh, only the language ability will uh, improve through time. So, the elderly society is a very good fit to the language technology. So, so this is another reason. That's really interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> would either of you like to um, continue on this topic? The uh, influence or effects of the um, COVID-19 pandemic era and how that might have had either a positive, negative, or uh, change in pace in terms of technology? Mm. Uh, in terms of disability, there is a huge gap between people living in the city and in the countryside. And that is true to us also, but 
in terms of disability, the gap is enormous. So for example, technology like Zoom made it possible for them to communicate with each other, like, and it's really accessible. And because of the COVID, I think more and more people are interested in accessibility because they feel kind of, uh, everybody kind of experienced of feeling kind of isolated and need to connect with each other. So I think that kind of affects how they need, they feel the necessity to have accessibility available to them. And also, I didn't include it. We, I, I'm afraid my presentation might have sounded a little bit pessimistic, but <laughs> because it was like 15 minutes, so I, I kind of condensed everything I wanted to say. But uh, uh, I think one good example is Orihime. I didn't include in the presentation, and I, if you're in Japan, I really want everyone to visit there. And Orihime is a place uh, served. Uh, with, I don't know how to describe that. Uh, it's a robot cafe and it allows uh, disabled people at home uh, serve like as like a cafe worker or like carry things and it's completely operated by disabled workers uh, through robot. So those kind of innovations uh, they uh, I think they won a Grand Prix of Good Design Award last year, but I think it's it's not directly related to COVID, but it has an influence, I think, of COVID. I think a lot of people who felt invincible, felt vulnerable, maybe for the first time during this period at various different levels, or at least, f or, or felt uh, a renewed empathy for others that they were suddenly responsible for. It wasn't just about our own bodies anymore, but the risk of carrying, uh, you know, carrying the virus home to others. So we became much more palpable, this need to protect and also be aware of others' vulnerability. Um, I, I think there's a few people wondering where exactly the Orihime Cafe is. <laughs> I want to show, but I, it, it's not really projected here, so maybe I can like, add slides. Ah, so maybe after the break, yeah. we, can, we can just introduce a little yes, bit about that. I, I'd love to. Certainly. Thank you very much. So um, as I mentioned in my kind of presentation slides over and over, I... I wouldn't say I miss those eras, uh, I mean, the, the time of uh, pandemic, but uh, 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 certainly there was this, uh, uh, the, t the time of pandemic really allowed us to sort of re rethink about the kinds of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, relationship that we had with our own selves. And I think that was the thing that we are missing right now. It's because of the, uh, because of the locked in situation, a, a lot of things kind of like started working in a way that we were familiar with, but that created a kind of a, a, a our creative space for really redefining like, oh wow, like how I would start the day, uh, how would I, how I would you know eat the lunch, uh, how I would go to a place where I used to go to without any consciousness, but. It was uh, we had to make like really creative choices every day in every uh, part of our uh, life, and uh, the way we connected with friends or family, uh, we really had to really look for uh, an alternative ways or the ways that would really work for our own, uh, you know, isolated selves. So I kind of missed that moment, and, um, and we we really became familiar with the new kind of I wouldn't say new, but Technology that weren't really on our, uh, you know, within our radar before. Like, if you remember, there was something called Clubhouse. We all forgot, but um, uh, we had like such a pleasure in just being able to listen to other people's voices at the time. Uh, and uh, for some reasons, I mean, uh, at the time we thought that, that that's the life that would continue forever, which is kind of pessimistic. But uh, now that the whole craze is over. Uh, we we forgot that kind of like uh, you know awareness uh, and somehow in, in probably in your word uh, 
we were trying to re re we were trying to empower ourselves during those times, like re empower ourselves in a way that we didn't we hadn't experienced before. But now, uh, since we're back into the no like normal life, uh, I think we have lost some sort of like a, a awareness that we used to have during the time. And then I think I don't know how where it is going to, but I kind of miss that time. It's interesting because, uh, I mean, the new conversations came about about the ability for technology to help us maybe restore a work-life balance that had been lost. I think particularly in this country, work-life balance is, you know, the conversation wasn't really being had in the same way that it's been had in Europe for, for, for decades at this point. Um, so I, I think we will, some of these points are going to come up uh, again, when we talk about like from here and the future and how design can basically um, help to build the future that we want. Um, and for now, I guess what I'd like to do is open up to some questions. Um, if, any questions for uh, individual speakers or if you have a general question, that's also welcomed. Uh, okay, so uh, first and then second. Yeah. I think we can prepare a microphone for you. Here it comes. Well, um, I just would like to ask all of you a question. So be it uh, generative AI or robotics, all these technologies needs to be implemented to bring new changes to our societies. And behind all these technology or development of technologies, there are capital money. And also uh, users who would pay back the capitalist, the money spent. So, so how do you f see all of you? Uh, these technologies uh, attract would attract capital, and then users who would pay back the investment. And how can we navigate that process towards the direction that you 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 think it's better than than letting things go? Because what Giles or Giles has described, he described how horse were turned into gasoline-based automotives. And the process was horrendous. I mean, it was not the way the society wanted the society to go. In his model, he described that, but we don't want to be <laughs> described by Giles in the future that we, we knew what was going to happen, and we just simply let that happen. So, so the question is, how can we attract capitalists and the users? Uh, would any of you like to feel that question? Yeah, thank you very much. Let me, let me, yeah, let me work. Um, yeah, that is a very good question. And uh, I think that is the, the, the most uh, uh, critical issues in uh, academia industry relationship in, in Japan. And uh, uh, people in universities are, are doing research and uh, sometimes uh, invent something very, very good. But uh, uh, the capitalism, uh, you know, f f for for the uh, academic achievement to realize the the uh, social benefit, it is very weak in, in Japan. So that, that's why my my love is doing uh, intensively with, with the regard uh, industry uh, academic collaboration, and also we are fostering uh, many youngsters that to to establish their own startups. Uh, compared to Silicon Valley, uh, the uh, the Japanese startups are not supported by the uh, large uh, venture capital ca capitals, and uh, uh, that's partly because the, uh, the Japanese startups startups are uh, targeting the Japanese domestic market. Uh, so uh, th that's why the, the payback is uh, a s um, a smaller compared to the global startups. So. So that's why uh, the uh, large v VCs cannot invest large money. So uh, we have to change that, that structure somehow. So that's what uh, I'm stru struggling every day. So <laughs> thank you very much for asking. Yeah. Would you like to add a comment? Um, as I, as I uh, showed you in my, some of my slides, I kind of follow the, the history of the plastics how it turned to a craze during the 1960s and 70s. It was so convenient, it was so 
um, adapted. It was so plastic, we can change uh, the shapes of it. And it was so low cost that it spread uh, rapidly in the, all, of my, uh, all of our uh, sectors and domains, industrial domains. Uh, but it was in the 1990s that the sort of true cost or environmental and health costs of those plastic technologies were found by you know, a, a very handful of uh, uh, scientists. But uh, those, even those uh, findings and concerns about the, the health and uh, uh, environmental uh, you know, impacts of the plastics were kind of wiped away or ignored by the industry of the time, like who's, who's you know, really powering those plastic industry. So, uh, and I think it is similar. I'm not you know, counter, counter arguing uh, Professor Matsuoka, but, um, uh, Matsuo, uh, but we have, in, and I, I think in the, the internet was formed in a way that we don't have a state ruling everything, right? It's uh, because it was made in a way that uh, people have open access to, and uh, there's no like one regulating body of the the internet. Uh, but instead, what we what we had what we have had in the past 20 years or so is that the large companies are sort of like uh, 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 working in a way as if it's like a, a company and a state because it regulates. Its, I mean, it has all the it creates all the roles and it talks to the consumers. Uh, and it also makes money, and uh, and when when things are tied to that, when our in, you know computer technologies are tied to that very large amount of capital going into certain very handful uh, uh, companies, then it will become difficult when there are some concerns about the development of those technologies. You know, like our my my students. I mean, look, uh, like uh, Professor Matsos, I guess, like you know. Uh, we have like not these days we have just students just doom scroll scrolling all the time like it takes like two or three hours of the uh, of the day of the person and they're just looking at all the TikToks every day every day every day, every day. and is that the, the kind of society we want or we wanted in you know in the first place we don't know but uh, uh, that type of things can happen in the future and uh, so we we have to have some sort of like uh, you know self regulating system that that's what I think uh, guiding the development of uh, the, the advanced technologies, which will become even smarter than we are, right? Thank you very much. Would you like to add to it? it it's uh, your discretion. Yeah. Uh, it, it, <laughs> my topic is really difficult to talk in terms of the market because I've been invited to talk like, this kind of conference, but uh, like, held by companies, but a lot of them are interested, but really uh, cannot really implement because the market is too small. But that, that's not going to change. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's really uh, not a case of, uh, I don't know how to call this. Uh, for example, uh, media love to talk about cutting edge technologies for dis disabled people. But I think the biggest problem is that most of those technologies are not covered by the insurance, so that they are out of reach uh, from, uh, for those who really need them. So I think uh, my mission is to make those companies aware that accessibility related, is related to them. It, accessibility is not just for disabled people. Otherwise, the market is small. That's not going to change. OK, thank you very much. So the gentleman behind had a, a question also. Hi, good evening. I have like a few points. I will try to condense them. Uh, regarding the change of technology and the change of humanity alongside technology that will always happen. Uh, I have like uh, a specific uh, example of Orihime Cafe. It's amazing because of, of uh, people with different abilities uh, being able to uh, attend customers and things like that. And that blended completely well with COVID-19 because people were able to go 
and have interaction without having the dangers of the pandemic at that moment. But we also have here in Japan, a, a, I, I lived here 11 years ago, and I am here once again, and, and a lot of things change, especially because of the pandemic. Like, for example, we have restaurants where do you, you, you won't interact with anyone anymore. They just give you your food. You scan a QR code, you choose your food, and, and they go there and they put the, the food in your, sorry, in your table, and that's it. So we have these two like, approaches, completely different. I think regarding uh, accessibility and inclusion and universal design, uh, and I want to know if you agree with this, uh, giving people the freedom of choice, it's one of the most important things to uh, evolve alongside technology. Because we uh, still have a lot of persons that want interaction. And we have other persons that do not want the interaction, but they want to do the same things that we are supposed or everyone is supposed to be able to do. So having the concept of universal design being a uh, no people, uh, we have no persons that are disabled. What disables them are the technology or the designs because they are not well designed and they do not give them the freedom of choice. Maybe having restaurants with the two options. Uh, if you want to interact with the waiters, you can do it. If you do not want to interact with the waiters, you can also do it. I think this, uh, according to what I believe, and I want you to, to know if you agree with it, this will be better for for everyone because everyone can uh, uh, be part of of the society because the society or the technologies are adapting to the persons and not the other way around we are not being forced to scan a qr code or we are not being forced to interact with people but at the end we are going to be able to have a meal eat something and go out and go back to the places that we are. And this connect a little bit, or maybe a lot, with uh, AI. Because AI can be a part of this, helping people to do whatever they want. The only problem, and, and this is also a question, it's AI can be a, a really helpful application to, to enable people to do different things to inspire people to be like a support, but it also can be a little bit dangerous because it can disable people because people are going to stop doing uh, uh, essays or drawings or illustrations or things like that. And, and maybe AI needs to be completely regulated to avoid like this misuse of or companies, for example, using AI instead of, of, of persons, uh, 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 hiring people. Or I think AI can be really helpful and really dangerous in this concept and in every concept, but especially in the concept of giving people accessibility to new technologies and to continue their, their lives. Because at the end, universal design will increase the market because it's going to allow everyone to be part of, of the society in general. And you are increasing the market just like that, but you can also cut the market if you do not regulate it really well. So that's my comment, and I want to know your opinion about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your, your detailed comment. I think the latter part of your question is going to overlap a lot with our discussion in the second half. So if you don't mind, I'll ask, just considering uh, our time restraint for the first half, um, I'll ask uh, uh, Ms. Tanaka to respond to the first half about this uh, kind of ideal of having everyone having the option to kind of opt in or opt out. Is this, is this the goal? Does it seem like a solution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I... I couldn't talk. Uh, in, I couldn't include this uh, in my presentation. But having a choice is the most essential part of accessibility. So I think, for example, I gave an example of a cochlear implant, and a cochlear implant is the idea of implanting technology on the person who have disability. But if the person 
doesn't want this technology, there should be a technology uh, for him or her to live as she wants and preserve her language and community. So, but somehow technology has focused on cutting edge or most advanced kind of experimental uh, technology and kind of uh, hmm, negates the importance of having analog kind of communication or interaction or how we can enhance such communication. So I think we have to have choice and that's for sure. Thank you very much. And we're right on time. So in about 10 seconds, we're going to break. Uh, we're going to break for 30 minutes. So please take some time to think and digest. And maybe even if you have a question one to one that you'd like to ask during that time, we'll come back after that 30 minutes. And we're going to focus on um, a discussion that is facing towards the future from now, both positive and negative, and uh, hoping to uh, come up with a collective statement together with uh, Anna Ariola Canada, who will join us for the second half. Thank you very much. So, can I have a round of applause for our speakers, please? Okay, thank you all for joining us for the second part of this technology breakout session. So, we're um, we're tasked with a difficult challenge which is to come up with a statement. Um, so I'll just read for you again the title and subtitle of this session, which you may or may not have read. So the main title is Technology, which is enormous. Um, and writing a statement about technology would be, I think it would take us all day. Uh, we have a subheading of Designing Digital Transformation. Okay, so we have a little context of transformation and design. And then our further subtitle is How Digital Transformation Will Change Humanity in the Coming Age and What Design Can Do. So at the end, I'm going to ask the question about what design can do, and we'll tackle that. But we won't start with that. I think it's too big. So first of all, what I'd like to do is ask each of you to respond to um, a keyword that um, I've picked up from the keynote presentations and from our uh, pres presenters' uh, words and also questions today. And the first uh, keyword that I'd like to focus on and I'd ask you to respond to is that of choice. And technology has been, you know, uh, gradually its presence has been increasing in our world. We're born into the world technology free, unclothed. <laughs> and, uh, and, and from that, you know, design and technology protect us and, and f perform various different functions. Um, sometimes a barrier between us and nature, and sometimes it connects us. Um, so in all these different ways. But from now, um, well, maybe I should just mention briefly, we already talked about um, uh, the COVID effect and, and how that affected maybe um, our adoption of technology. Um, so I'd, ask, I'd like to ask each of you to basically comment on this issue or problem of choice, um, increase or decreasing in the availab availability of choice um, on a personal and uh, larger scales going forward in terms of technology. So, but I'd like to start actually with, uh, if you don't mind, uh, with Tanaka San, so you'll have an opportunity to uh, introduce um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Orihime. Orihime, yeah. So maybe start with that, and then you can respond to um, this issue of choice. Um, actually, I'm not <laughs> from this company, so it <laughs> I don't know why I'm advertising, but I really want you to visit if you're in Japan. And I mentioned Orihime, but it's the name of robot. So the name of the cafe is Dawn Avatar Robot Cafe, and it's in Nihonbashi. And it is operated by people who have severe disabilities and cannot leave home. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Their website said, uh, says we are not operated by AI. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it is actually operated by uh, people. And uh, there is a URL on this slide. And if you have any chance, if you have any free time, please visit there. And they will have uh, really uh, interesting communication methods and that could inspire you in any way. 
Thank you very much. So next, if you wouldn't mind to maybe, if you don't mind, would you, would you go first perhaps to respond to this question of choice? Um, uh, you can take any angle you like. Uh, it can be like uh, something that we need to consider about. It could be a concern. It could be a positive. Um, but I'd like you to think towards a statement about choice in uh, the, I guess, integration, further integration of technology into our lives in the future. I think I already kind of answered uh, in the, at the end of the previous uh, session, but having a choice is really uh, the most essential part of accessibility, uh, regardless of uh, disability. And I think uh, technology should be utilized not only to enhance uh, the ability or, or compensate disability, rather technology should be used to open up possibilities of not choosing cutting edge technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, so technology, uh, sorry, technology should be used to open up the, the possibilities of not choosing cutting edge technologies. Correct, okay, that's a very interesting statement. <laughs> Let me write that down fully. Uh, would you like to continue? Does it does it have to be in a in a form of a statement like that? It does not. Like so it doesn't need to be. But if it does, it's wonderful for me. But oh. you don't feel like you need to build a statement. We'll work on that together. I don't think I could come up with a very good, uh, concise statement right now. So I'll just uh, I, I will touch upon a few keywords uh, for the in terms of the planetary environment. The choice. Uh, I think there are two two or three things. One is that um, we have to be, we, only ha we, we can only make a choice when we are informed of the, the, the options that we have. And uh, sometimes we are not fully informed or sometimes there are, uh, the options are not available at hand. Sometimes we are not uh, uh, empowered to take those choices or options, so that's kind of a one sort of basic, one of the basics of uh, the uh, for 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 making a choice that uh, what can I say? That's that's the basics for our choices. And the second thing is uh, the priority. So we can make millions and millions of choices, but we really, I mean, I think it's a, it now is the time for us to really concentrate on the choices that should be prioritized. Because otherwise, as I did, uh, said in my presentation, we can be mesmerized by you know, other choices that aren't really, really important for who we really want to be in the future. So, and we have this tendency to be really like hyped up with the, with the you know, uh, present choices that are speaking loud or that are you know, looking sexy or that, are, uh, you know, that catches our attentions. But uh, I think we, we have to, when we make a great, uh, you know, in order to make good choices, we have to sort of step back to look at the, the map of like the, what the choices are and then really try to prioritize the one that really should be uh, prioritized. The third thing is, uh, in terms of the planetary environments, actually our choices are uh, getting less and less. I mean, uh, the, uh, what we call an, uh, uh, the windows of opportunity or a window of opportunities uh, is closing. So the more time we spend without making those uh, important choices, uh, we will have less and less uh, choices we will be able to make in the future, or we will have less and less choices that we can sort of uh, hand down to our future generations because we're on the really uh, at the, the edge of tipping point. Uh, so I think those are the those are the things that are really important to consider in terms of like thinking about the choice in technology. Um, yes. Thank you very much. I mean, you were hesitant about making statements, but you made <laughs> several really interesting statements there. I'll, I'll attempt to kind of uh, summarize them again at the end. But before we do, um, uh, Anna, would you like to uh, share your comments in relation to this issue of choice going forwards? Yeah, I, I, I want to be able to comment on the last uh, topic before we broke as well for the for the break. Um, and that was around the acceleration 
of these technologies due to the pandemic. Um, it was interesting to have been part of the organization, one of which on the planet like really sort of accelerated this being that I was at Microsoft during this time. And it was hard to believe that what we were going through in the two and a half years that we were all sort of sequestered to our homes, we went through about five to 10 years of technological, I wouldn't say advancement, but the, the acceleration of moving towards a more open hybrid mindset. We were already going to be heading that way because of talent recruitment issues, like we needed to recruit outside of where most of the headquarters were. But I think that opened up an opportunity of choice. Um, you know, if you think about Zoom didn't exist before the pandemic, as far as I know it didn't. Um, teams didn't exist, teams that we know it today. Um, and so I'm grateful for that. I think that's driven choice and to have experienced it, although I personally had agoraphobia coming out of it, it was hard for me to be in a situation like this with everyone, um, but it's all come back full circle. And for me, choice now on this particular uh, topic is about access. It's, I love the statement you made about to have choice, but then also to not have to choose if you don't want to. And to not be excluded by not choosing, just because you choose not to want to incorporate technology into your life, that shouldn't mean that you're basically ostracized or you're, you're written off. There should be a way to, to live and exist with or without technology. And for me, choice is also about um, access. We want to make sure that the choices that are available aren't of you know, the cost of like a hypercar. It's like you want technology to be accessible, to be approachable, to be usable, and most of all, uh, understandable, no matter what socioeconomic class you're coming from, no matter what technological uh, backbone you might be able to access that technology with. Um, and so for me, it's about access. Access is a huge top of mind topic. Thank you very much. Um, I think this idea of not being excluded by not choosing is is really crucial. And we, we've seen this like throughout. Everyone adapts to technology at a different pace. And when uh, like cell phones, mobile phones were first common, there was a lot of people that really resisted. They did not want to be connected all the time. They wanted to have that choice to not use it. And then smartphone technology and people didn't want to have one. And now you can't do anything without it. That's one of the major shifts that happened during the pandemic. Everything went, everything went digitized. Um, okay, so <laughs> we have a, a lot of interesting um, uh, statements here. I'm going to read back a few, and then maybe we'll see if we can. Maybe we don't need to choose one. Um, so we can we can make a choice only when we're fully informed. Uh, without without um, that access to information, we cannot prioritize our choices. Um, but in addition to that, um, we need to have the right to choose not to adapt certain technologies. How do we protect that? Because we've seen throughout uh, the history of technology, well, not everything has been adapted fully, but... Um, VR, for example, it always comes back again and again, and we never quite fully embrace it. But when it comes to technologies that really make life convenient and really make us as human beings and as resources for society more efficient, that this pressure to adopt the technology becomes, uh, the choice is gone in often cases, or it's there's very little interest in protecting that choice. Is there anything that, can be done about that? So let's just take smartphones as an example, right? Like I often choose to not carry my smartphone around with me because I choose to be more present with my children as a mom. I choose to be less psychologically burdened with the onslaught of the attack on human cognition, which is notifications. Um, and so that's one approach we could take to choosing not to choose. It just would require those of us that are stewarding these future technologies, services, and, and, and amazing capabilities, we also have in mind as one of the user profiles is someone that's off the grid, someone that chooses not to use the technology. And it just needs to be part of the marketing requirements. And so that's, that's one way 
to take a look at that and how to maybe make that tangible and make that real. Um, and that opens up a, a possibility to create other opportunities to service those people that choose to be offline. That's a whole new separate business model we can go explore. I'd love to talk about that with you later. But yeah, that, that's, those are my thoughts. Would you like to respond to Anna's thoughts on that? That's a difficult one. <laughs> yeah, it is a difficult one. I think, <laughs> and I promise we'll, we'll I, move I on after it, that. Yeah, it, uh, I, I, there's something. To, I think that has something to do with the nature of choosing. Like, mm. I think that uh, one of the most important choices that we make are the choices that you make at first. When you go into the wrong, I mean, when you take a bad, big choice at an original point, then the rest of the choices will only be... Variants of bad. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> bad to worse, right? So, because, for example, like, it was, it, was, uh, it was brave that you chose not to have that, not to carry that telephone in front of your uh, uh, kids. But that's a, that's a brave choice that a, a lot of people can't, don't have the courage to do. Because it, you know, uh, a lot of troubles might follow, like in terms of like, communication. But since you made that great choice, uh, the rest of the choices that you will make that day will be in between very good or good, mm -hmm. right? But if I decided to carry that smartphone, it will only be, the choices will only be like whether or not I will answer those notifications, whether or not I will open it up right now or later. And that wouldn't change the, the, the whole situation. So, uh, so I think the, the choices that we make early will affect the rest of the choices that we'll make in the future. And it's always important that we make great choice in the first place. And that's a very difficult thing, but we should be aware of the, aware of the fact. Because once you make a wrong choice in the first place, then we will have less and less good choices. And of course, that's not just at a personal level, but at a society as level, a society, def when definitely. we make this choice a, collectively yeah. to adopt certain yeah. technologies. And so so we, we have to be aware that like, what are the very important choices that we are making in the very like in the in the, in the next year or next few years, what are like the fundamental choices that will affect the future, and to be aware of, like uh, at least to be uh, what's the word vigilant about the yeah. the kinds of choices that we will be making in the future because otherwise we will look back at the uh, at us now saying well like I shouldn't have carried the the telephone with me, but that's I too late. I love all of your statements that you've made today because I feel like I'm in like season three of Loki, Cause, like like <laughs> the multiverse. Like it's like every decision we make, the the universe is going to thread off right. down this other path. And but that's our it, it is that's our yeah, everyday it, life, it and is. it's, a it's awesome. Yeah, it. uh, so we're yeah. sci-fi prototyping. We are. By the way. <laughs> that's definitely that's that's exactly what Tim in Gold said in his keynote speech. Like we're all of us. All he of did. us is an experiment with life. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of our life is an experiment, and uh, I think we're making creative choices every day in every moment. But the choice that we made a few, a few, some time back, creates this reality. And if we don't make very good choice uh, right now, then we will have like, what's the word? Uh, kind of a worse form of reality, Mo yeah. worse mode of Timelines reality. Timelines will fork, you know, uh, <laughs> tomorrow or the next week or. You know, two weeks later. So well, in the societal level, I think that's... Hindsight plays into this, too. Not everyone has the luxury of hindsight. I, it, what you pointed out and what I said about choosing not to carry a phone, if you would ask me, having been part of the original iPhone development team, not carrying my phone around, I, like you would have said that's not, that's not who you are. But I know now, after X many, a decade plus, that the notifications have become a, an attack on human cognition. And did we know that when we were working on the original iPhone? No, because we just wanted to make sure all of you could read the New York Times, your favorite newspaper, in the pocket of, of like, you know, in the palm of your hand. So, yeah, hindsight. I, we, I don't know if we could thread hindsight into technology. I wish we could. Um, 
Well, maybe some predictive AI model yeah. will be able to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to, um, I'm going to move on to the next topic because we could talk about this forever. <laughs> but I don't want to talk only about choice. I, I also want to bring in something that I think um, we have to acknowledge people's anxiety about shifts and change in our modes of interaction. And especially when it comes to mediated interactions, because once we have mediated uh, interactions, there's a mediator. And whether that's an in independent body, whether there's a human in control of it, um, there's something, there's something there. And to use it, we need to trust it. And at the moment, um, I don't want to talk only about um, uh, generative AI, but I think one of the uh, big concerns about the future rapid progress of technology right now and the one element where the conversation seems to be that we don't have a choice is that generative AI is already here, it's already integrated, there's no stopping it, you may as well just go with it and be uh, and see what it can do for us. But this brings about the issue of trust because we have in a lot of cases these black box uh, technologies that we don't fully understand the potential of and the designers themselves say they do not understand that they're uh, they understand how they work in theory, but they don't understand the limit of their potential, which in any other sector would be quite terrifying, but it's also exciting at the same time. Um, so really what I would like you to respond to, whether you choose to uh, discuss uh, AI technology or not, um, is this issue of trust and technology and how much, of, how much trust we put in the technologies that mediate our experiences in the world. And if you have a statement, that'd be wonderful. Um, Feel free to just tackle a small area in relation to trust. You don't have to tackle the big topic. Uh, it's up to you. That's something, actually, I wanted to ask Dr. Matsuo. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> if you're watching at home, we miss you. <laughs> Uh, but actually, I, w uh, I was talking about ableism in my presentation, and I feel like AI also uh, operates based on ableism because it doesn't have, it doesn't uh, include enough data of people with disabilities because of access issues, because there is no accessibility, there's not enough accessibility for them to participate in the activities that we do. So I, mm, I'm not sure how it's related to trust, but when I uh, hear news or development of AI, I always, I am reminded that this is a matter of majority. And though there are people who are left out and I cannot, in that sense, I cannot really trust the data because I know those who are excluded physically, so yeah. Can I piggyback onto what you just said? So, you know, a lot of the data set that's out there has been trained off of the last couple decades of people who forgot to turn on their privacy settings for Flickr or, Getty Images, which doesn't include, you know, unique ability individuals. And, and the the photography, stock photography sites that are now starting that do include photography of a wide range of marginalized po populations, um, it's so small compared to Getty. And so, yeah, it's, there needs to be a lot more done about that. I would almost say, I mean, this is me maybe not really going off topic, but like advocating for those of those marginalized communities, mm -hmm. At, like picking their favorite photos and just like finding a way to to release it in a safe way so that it can train the systems to deliver the results that are more appropriate and inclusive and 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 it also comes back to what I talked about in the keynote where I had liberal arts as being part of the hard sciences that it, it, designers and and people that are going to be using this technology are going to need to under, know and understand because you're going to need to write it in. You shouldn't have to write in these descriptions, but in your narrative and in your tokens for the Gen AI, you're going to have to explicitly call out the scene and the emotion and the modality and the ability within the frame to get something returned that may be appropriate, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. Um, we need to do research. And yes, I was 
Matsuo san was here because we could, yeah. could ask him. I can I add something? Okay. Uh, actually, I mm, I think it is quite tricky that there are people with disability who buy into like inspiration porn narratives themselves. So and those people have access, like often have access to like mainstream narratives. So they know that if they put on the, those images, it will go viral so, they, so that they can become famous. So uh, there is a danger in like who should be represented and how. It's almost like you should be pre-qualified to generate those images. Like you should be of the community of the marginalized population to be able to allow for that. And I think there's ways that that harm can be mitigated by the the major multinational companies that are out there as part of um, a way to understand who is posting what, and ideally through sentiment analysis, what the intent is. Very similar to the way that um, my former employers would fight against child pornography or other types of hate speech and harm. There's ways to algorithmically go after that. And this is just a new, I'll put you in touch with the red team over at Microsoft. This is a good conversation um, to see how might we. Uh, fantastic, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to respond? All right, um, I don't know if it is really about the trust that I have with the, 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 the technologies or uh, artificial intelligence in particular, uh, I I always try to like when when I meet those like you know like uh, new applications or this chat GPT um, yes I, I I approach it with a caution and uh, I try to make it a point to how can I say to to really look at myself when I face with the technology uh, thinking that will I like the person that I am going to become by using this technology? And if the answer is yes, I will go with that. And I will sort of enlarge, or, uh, enlarge that concept to include the society. Uh, do I, will I like the, the way people live with this communication device or with this artificial intelligence or with this new technology, then my answer will be yes. But if I don't like the way people, the, the, people, the, the kinds of people that they will become, if I don't like that, then probably there will be some issues with the, the, the affordance of the technology or like something that the technology is giving us or allowing us to do. And that's kind of like a judgment standard with, uh, that I kind of like used to, to, to see the situation because it is very difficult. When you just start with the functionality, is it convenient or not? Yeah, maybe it is convenient. Is it, you know, uh, help, does it help you, com you know, uh, communicate with other people uh, remotely? Yes, it does. Uh, does it help you uh, understand the world, you know, the, does it help you to receive the, the news uh, at like a lightning speed? Yes, it does. And then, go, so, you know, on and on, I will just like go deeper and deeper into the technology. But uh, in the end, will I like the kind of person that I will become with these technologies? And if the answer is no, maybe I, I made the wrong choice <laughs> in the first place. That's really interesting and very like um, strong ethical way of thinking about um, the consuming of technology, yeah, which often we consume yeah. it because it's there and we use it because it's convenient. Yeah. But this, and when we think more ethically about things like the material, uh, the materials that we use and the objects that we consume, and even in terms of like the foods that we choose to eat. Um, but we can certainly extend this into um, our value systems and how that's reflected in the technology that we choose. Yeah, mm. because it's you know we have you know more and more we have like series of series of series of innovations every every month every week, almost every day basis, and we don't know what the nature is. 
And uh, if we start making the choice just by looking at the, the external functionalities, then I mean, they're made so that we will say yes, right? Like mm -hmm. most, most of the things that are in the market right now, they're there because they, they did the, a great research, uh, market research, and they did the great designing. So I, someone like me would say yes. Uh, but uh, but it's kind of like a balancing act. And um, we should be focusing on not the external functionalities, but the kind of like you know, internal capability that we have or some, some, some sort of identity that we want to have like as a, as a new humanity or new humanism, sh sh am I going to be a better human using these technologies or am I going to be a, a worse human using these technologies? That could be one, one way to look at like if the technology is really uh, doing great things for us or not. It, it has to be enhancing in a meaningful way for each of us that make that decision in a... Um, in a thoughtful approach, like I, you know, I'm not, I talk about techno optimism and like where I stand in all this as, as someone in the middle of, of, of this technology, but I'm still trying to find my own way. Um, like what do I use on a daily basis? What do I use occasionally that I feel wholesome about in a way? Um, and then I've always got the thought and the threat of hallucinations. Like, is this, is this legit? You know, is this is this enhancing what my original statement or ask was in, into the machine, or is this like, is this turning me, or or, or is it off brand for me? And uh, yeah, like my my kids too. Like when we started working on this originally, I was super excited to share that with them, and they're like, "We're not using that, mom." And I'm like, "But it could be like a, a companion that's helping you with your homework, or like like a design buddy you're drawing with after school." Like, nope. Not, 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 nope, like super anti-tech. And so after this conference, I'm going to go back. I'm going to share some of my learnings and I'm going to see where their mindset is because it's been a few <laughs> months. Yeah. So, um, so for our last less than five minutes, believe it or not, um, I have a, a, one more question and you can respond, respond any way you like to it. Um, let me just reframe it within the subtext or subheading of this conference. So designing digital transformation, how digital transformation will change humanity in the coming age and what can design do? So what can design do? <laughs> I don't need the absolute That's answer. Um, so we've talked about issues of uh, choice and trust. And even in a small way, we have a room full of people who are actively involved in design. What even tiny steps of whether it's action or consciousness or choice, what can we do as a maybe first step to taking back some control over the trajectory of this uh, new humanity and technology? No pressure or anything. <laughs> I, I will start by like giving a, a like very general <laughs> comment so uh, Paula can make up for it. <laughs> but... Um, yeah. I am I am partially non-designer, um, and uh, you but are <laughs> thank research you so is much. part of our thank you. Uh, but I, I I worked with a lot of great designers. One of, one of them is here, Mr. Shibata. Uh, that I learned to collaborate with designers, and I really love working with them with you. And the, I think one of the great greatest things that in this time of digital transformation and at the same time in this time of great ecological crisis is that you can teach people the general public uh, the, the the this rich knowledge of coping with new things coping with very different elements in a society and really combining them into uh, a better uh, a society or better uh, a community or better products or better elements in our society. Y you can all teach your friends, uh, your family members, your community members, uh, your children how to cope with this new technology. And I think it's one of the things that the designers uh, are, uh, you know, uh, capable of doing. And um, we hope that I hope I I I will wait for that to happen. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's really kind of inspiring 
makes makes everyone want to do something really positive. Um, so, Tomaxon, uh, would you like to respond to that massive question of what can design do? <laughs> Uh, I've been working on accessibility, and I feel uh, I I'm quite optimistic uh, in terms of how accessibility is implemented in the game industry right now, and I believe the uh, game industry is the most advanced uh, industry in terms of accessibility and how it kind of elicit the agency of players rather than providing information or instructing them what to do. So I feel um, technology has a kind of hidden uh, the, uh, for example, I, I mentioned in my presentation that uh, interaction should, be, should become more visible rather than hidden, and those uh, are implemented in some of the games released in these few years. So I feel like uh, technologies are already there, but there needs to be other ways of thinking how we can make those technologies uh, understandable or accessible or uh, yeah accessible to people who need them and yeah I think I'm coming back to my first answer so technology should be used not only to enhance technology itself but also benefit those who do not choose to use the technology. Thank you very much. Um, we're just on time. I was about to ask Anna for the final word. If there's any final, uh, anything that you would like to add? I really, like the movie Her, it still deeply resonates with me in terms of an ethical, enlightening stewardship of what was once fiction, but is now reality in, in our real world. And for me, having cognitive therapy, um, being one of the, the sciences that will be part of the development of the evolution of AI for humankind's betterment, um, because so many people in the world, I, I believe in therapy, uh, need it um, to work through various different things that are going on in everyone's lives. That's that's my hope, and I know that there are amazing research scientists that are working on this right now. It's just making sure, again, coming back to how do we not cause harm. Um, so for me, yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. So that's where we're going to wrap up for now. Um, in uh, very shortly, um, the moderators from all of the panels are going to come together and present our statements. Um, I have multiple statements, which I'm going to try and edit, but hopefully we can uh, find out where the overlap is between the other breakout sessions. Thank you very much. Can I have a round of applause for our speakers, please? Thank you for navigating us. Thank you, Mary.